everyone. Welcome to OsteoBytes. Um, we'll give a few seconds for everyone to get settled in our virtual room. Okay, we're so glad to be back. My name is Christina Iptoma, and I am mom to Osteo Angel Dillon and Director of Scientific Programs at MIB Agents. And today on OsteoBytes, we are talking with Dr. Jeffrey Bryan about a pre-targeted approach to delivery of radiopharmaceutical therapy for bone cancer. Thank you so much, Dr. Ryan, for joining us on Osteobytes today. We're thrilled to have you. Um, and I was just saying, we've been wanting to have you on since your paper was published in the fall. So glad that we were able to make this happen. A little bit more about our guest today. Dr. Jeffrey Bryan earned his DMV from the University of California at Davis in 1993. And he worked as an associate veterinarian from 1993 to 1995, served as medical director from 95 to 2002 of the Irving Street Veterinary Hospital in San Francisco, California. Shout out to the Bay Area where I am. Um, Dr. Bryan then completed a medical oncology residency, a master's of biomedical sciences, and a PhD in pathobiology at the University of Missouri. He received certification by the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine and Oncology 2005. And he is the director of the Tom and Betty Scott Endowed Program in Veterinary Oncology the Director of Pet Imaging Center of the University of Missouri and Associate Department Chair for Research and the Associate Director of Comparative Oncology for the Ellis Fischel Cancer Center. Dr. Bryan's research focuses on comparative examination of cancers in companion animals to better understand cancers in all species. And his particular areas of interest are targeted imaging and therapy, epigenetics and immunotherapy of cancers. He directs the Pet Imaging Center, which seeks to develop novel pet imaging agents for cancer diagnosis, localization, and prognostication. And he studies DNA methylation of canine non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And he also studies immunotherapy in companion dogs, including investigating fetal microchimerism. Um, I definitely had to Google that last word. Um, and I think it means the presence of cells from one individual in another, um, like in pregnancy. Um, That's correct. But uh, you could probably explain that way better than I could. <laughs> so welcome, Dr. Ryan, and welcome everyone joining us today. Please feel free to add any questions you have for Dr. Ryan to the Q&A as we move along. Um, and before we get started, I just have some announcements and reminders. It's good to be back on Osteobytes. We took a bit of a break during our Factor conference. Um, so thank you to all our Factor 23 attendees who came to connect and collaborate and made 2023 our best Factor yet. Um, we're going to be sharing links to videos of all the scientific uh, sessions shortly. Um, as well as photos so you can um, relive it or, or see what you missed. Um, but you don't have to miss it next year. And looking at you, Dr. Bryan, um, save the date for June 20th to 22nd in Cleveland for Factor 2024. And July is Sarcoma Awareness Month. So um, we have another fundraiser where you can help raise awareness and funds for osteosarcoma patients, programs, education, and research by supporting our Seeds of Hope campaign. With a $5 donation, you'll receive a packet of sunflower seeds to plant and help raise awareness during Sarcoma Awareness Month. The bright and cheery sunflower reminds us to always have hope. And if you don't have a green thumb or just planting's not your thing, you can also just donate. And then we will gift um, a pack of seeds um, and send a message of hope to an osteo warrior in treatment. And we also have a new t-shirt for Sarcoma Awareness Month um, with a cool sunflower design on it. And um, if you don't already have one, MIB shirts are the softest ever. So um, great design, super soft t-shirt, get to order one. I'll put a link in the um, chat. And then lastly, we have Healing Hearts for Parents um, this month on July 19th, also one next month on August 16th, both are at 7 p.m. And starting in September, Healing Hearts for Parents will be on both Wednesday evenings and Sunday afternoons. And I should also just clarify, Healing Hearts is our a grief workshop program. Um, so there'll be different workshops for parents um, and also separate workshops for both young adult siblings and teen siblings. So um, I'll put a link in the chat with more information on those. Um, and you can also contact Isabel at mibagents.org for any more questions on that. So um, those are kind of our announcements for today. And with that, uh, Dr. Ryan, if you wanna go ahead and start sharing your screen and then we can move on to your presentation. That working properly? That looks great. Great. Well, I'm deeply honored to be here today, Christina. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm sorry it took us so long to schedule. We had quite a winner this year here at MU. Uh, but it's fun to be here, and it's fun to talk about our pilot project 
that we did in collaboration with Dr. Brian Zeglis at Hunter College in New York. And so I'm going to be talking today about some work we did in a pre-targeted approach to delivering radiopharmaceuticals to bone tumors in dogs. See if I can make this work properly. There we go. Uh, I am not a chemist, and so I think it's worth reviewing some of this for non-chemists who might be in attendance. Click chemistry was developed about 20 years ago, uh, give or take, uh, for the purpose of connecting two molecules very quickly. Does my um, cursor show here on the screen well? Yes, it Perfect. does. So these are a couple of examples of click chemistry. And the main benefit of click chemistry as it was originally conceived was to be able to prepare two halves of a particular larger uh, compound or a larger molecule in different conditions. So for example, if your goal is to label a very large proteinaceous antibody with a radioactive atom, it sometimes requires a great deal of energy to drive that atom into a tight, um, um, what I'm trying to say, uh, a tight chelation relationship with a metal chelator to attach it to that antibody. And when you when I say it requires a great deal of energy, that's usually supplied in the form of heat. And so you might have to heat a bath up to 90 degrees or 95 degrees to drive the metal into the chelator to be able to get them to stick. Uh, and you want them to stick very tightly so that they don't leave their payload delivery vector, in this case, an antibody or another molecule, before they reach their target. And once they reach their target, we want them to stay there, not release and go back into systemic circulation uh, to give us nonspecific background activity. And you can imagine that if you took egg whites and you put them in a 95 degree Celsius water bath, they would immediately turn to cooked egg. And that's what happens to antibodies if you put them at a high temperature like that. So when you use click chemistry, you can put the click sites on the antibody at low temperature, preserving their structure. You can separately drive the radio metal into the other half of the click chemistry in order to create the radioactive ligand that then you just add near room temperature or close to body temperature to your antibody, and these will snap into place. And now you have a nicely radio labeled antibody for use in either imaging or potentially therapy. Some of the earlier click chemistries used either a copper catalyzed reaction that caused these to click together or something called a strain promoted click reaction. The problem is you cannot add enough copper to a body to catalyze this inside a body. And this one also is very sensitive to subtle pH changes and other organic molecules in the area that can stop that from happening. So this was primarily a test tube activity. So we would take an antibody or we would take a peptide like this somatostatin targeting peptide, and that we could, in a test tube, using click, add the radioactive molecule to that that could then be given for, say, PET imaging, for example, in this case of a radio-labeled somatostatin analog in an individual with neuroendocrine cancer spread throughout the liver. After a while, though, chemists started to realize that there was potential for this click to actually be used to pre-target treatment of a patient. And so the concept was that you could add this click moiety to an antibody inject it into the bloodstream and have it circulate through the body and slowly accumulate within the tumor over time. And these antibodies are very large, so they have a long circulation half-life in the blood, longer than you would ideally want to expose the body to radioactivity, for example. So we can cause these antibodies to accumulate covered in their click moieties, we can then, once those antibodies have left the bloodstream, so the only place that they remain present really in the body is where their target is, which is mostly on the tumor, we can add the other half of the click radio labeled with a radioactive element, and then it will go and stick right to these antibodies where they have attached themselves to the tumor cells. And the rest of this radioactivity will leave very quickly in the urine or some other route, typically the urine, and can be eliminated from the body. So any radioactivity that is not going to be targeted at the tumor for either imaging or therapy is rapidly eliminated from the body so that it doesn't cause any other off-target effects on the organism. And so what they, this early study, look, this is a, a review that was published in Nature Protocols, uh, looked at some of the, the, the um, 
uh, the tumor accumulation of the radioactivity and showed that with this pre-targeting, you could get lots of radioactivity accumulated at the tumor site uh, by using this pre-targeted approach. And this is an article that was authored by Dr. Zeglis, our collaborator at Hunter College, along with his collaborator, Dr. Lewis at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Dr. Zeglis looked at this in a mouse model of colon cancer. And in this case, they used an antibody that was targeted against the colon cancer cells within a mouse. This antibody had the pre-targeted uh, moiety. In this case, it's transcyclooctane, which is part of this inverse electron demand deals alder click chemistry, or IEDDA, is the acronym that you see in the literature describing it. And this allowed the antibody to circulate, bind to the tumor, and the slow clearance of the antibody wasn't important because you could wait days before injecting the radioactive dose. And then on the day of therapy, the other half, the tetrazine half of the label was labeled with lutetium-177, a radioactive element that's a beta emitter for emitting beta particles to kill tumors. That was injected and that would accumulate very rapidly at the site where these pre-placed antibodies were. So we send in the antibodies as soldiers to build the location for the radioactivity to attach. And then we send in the radioactivity, it attaches very quickly, kills the cancer cells and any remaining radioactivity is eliminated. And this biodistribution set of graphs gives us an idea of just how much radioactivity accumulates through this method in the tumor compared to other parts of the body. So compared to the blood that has a very rapid peak in activity, but goes away very quickly over just a couple of days, uh, the tumor accumulates over a couple of days, most of that radioactivity. So nearly an order of magnitude after a day or so over all of the other organs in the body. So a great therapeutic ratio where we can deliver much more killing payload to the tumor itself than the normal tissues would see. So potentially huge benefit. But Dr. Zeglis was writing grants to propose translation of this approach into human patients. And the constant criticism that returned was that although it was very nice how this worked out in mice, it was extremely unlikely that this IEDDA click chemistry would work in a volume as large as a human blood volume. And so that this was probably mostly an approach that could be used for treating cancer in mice, which is not our biggest problem that we want to try to solve. So I met Dr. Um, Zeglis here at the University of Missouri when he came to give a seminar here talking about this. And we got to talking about his already formulated product of this bisphosphonate, which we're, those of us who deal with bone cancer are familiar with bisphosphonates for, for relieving pain and building bone strength for patients with either metastatic to bone cancer or bone tumors themselves that's high phosphorus containing. So it delivers to the skeletal structure and particularly to areas of high bone turnover within the skeletal structure. And it was, it was coupled already to this transcyclooctene, the TCO, so that it could act as a pre-target location. So this could be injected into mice, it stuck to the bone, and then hours later, they could inject a radio-labeled tetrazine compound that would then click to this and stick wherever the bisphosphonate went. Because bisphosphonates work in any species, regardless of what types of proteins they express on their surface, this can cross-translate cross through mice to dogs, easily to humans potentially in the future as well. So we proposed looking at this to pro for proof of concept to show that it would work in a dog model of bone cancer. And coincidentally, unfortunately, our dogs that get bone cancer happen to be large dogs, not too far off from the size of a human and therefore a human blood volume to prove the concept that he was interested in. So the plan was to inject this, this bisphosphonate labeled with TCO, it would go and all these would stick to the areas of bone tumor. So you'd get some in normal bone and a lot more in the area of the tumor. And then an hour later, inject this radio ligand. So we had, in this case, copper 64, which is a positron emitting radionuclide. So we can see it with a PET scanner labeled to this tetrazine. And that would go then click to wherever the TCOs were labeled. The rest of it would clear quickly in the urine and we would be able to perform a PET scan and see where this had localized and perform statistical analysis to understand the preferential localization in the tumor 
compared to in the normal tissue. These are some of the mouse data that showed why this appeared to be a useful approach. Uh, these are PET scans of these mice at one hour, six hours, and 24 hours after the copper was injected. And you can see that areas around their joints and bladder and then skeleton are what light up. A three-dimensional rendering shows that very clearly with skeletal localization in the spine, pelvis, and long bones with more localization around the joints where these mice have uh, growth plates where there is active bone turnover. And interestingly, you get the sense that there is some radioactivity accumulating within the liver, which could be because the liver preferentially accumulates copper, but also bisphosphonate can be accumulated in reticuloendothelial organs, so the liver and the spleen as well. And looking at the biodistribution in these mice, first visually, this is a section of a femur from these mice, and you can see that the color scheme, the more red and yellow it is, the more radioactivity and the more blue it is, the less radioactivity. These areas of active growth at the ends of the bones had the majority of the radioactive uptake, whereas the rest of the quiet bone had less radioactive uptake. And that's borne out here in these graphs showing the percent injected dose of radioactivity per gram of tissue, that it was much, much higher, 20% uh, per uh, injected, or 20 percent of dose in um, in a gram of tissue per bone, whereas less than 5% for these other organs, except a little bit more in the liver and spleen, which fits with our visual interpretation of that image as well. And so that's something that we'll see again in the dog. So we looked at this in five dogs, and this was a bit of a challenge because, of course, all of this corresponded with the onset of our global pandemic, which made it difficult to, to accrue cases into clinical trials because we were a poorly staffed because we needed to operate in shifts so that the hospital always had staff in the hospital. Also, this required custom chemistry, and so the radioactivity needed to be delivered to the University of Missouri in the morning for the copper 64 from Washington University in St. Louis, and then the labeling of the compound, the tetrazine compound, had to take place, and then that had to be transported by special transport up to the teaching hospital for us to be able to inject into these dogs four hours after we originally injected the bisphosphonate. So these dogs would come in in the morning, we would inject them around noon with the bisphosphonate. We would inject them around or around 11 with the bisphosphonate. We would inject them around three or four o'clock with the radioactivity, which meant we had to scan these dogs four hours later at seven or 8 p.m. And so we were doing after hour scans on all of these patients, which was a bit of a challenge. But these dogs ranged in size from 22 kilograms, so nearly 50 pounds, to over 100 pounds at 54 kilograms, so really near human-sized dogs. Um, we gave two doses of bisphosphonate to look at the quality of the scans, either five milligrams per kilogram or 10 milligrams per kilogram, and identified rapidly that 10 milligrams per kilogram gave us a better quality image for sure. And then we did analysis looking at the PET uptake, looking at the standard uptake value of the activity, and the SUV max um, related to uh, the, um, the, the lesion to bone at the mean ratio was between two and a half and five and a half. And when we looked at compared to background, it was as high as 15 times the background body radioactivity. So we got really good uptake of the radioactivity in these dogs. So since we have only five dogs, I wanted to show each dog and kind of walk through the individual scans and, and show what we saw. So this was our very first dog. This was five milligrams per kilogram of the bisphosphonate injected. Um, the image is a little bit grainy, probably because we had less bisphosphonate target in the skeleton of this dog. And these are the dog's kidneys. This is a maximum intensity projection. So the scale is a little bit off based on the hottest intensity where the excretion was happening in the kidneys of this, this chelated copper. And the actual lesion is in this distal humerus but this dog had some pretty extreme elbow osteoarthrosis as well as some shoulder osteoarthrosis. So that had areas of fairly high bone turnover as well as an area in the spine that had spondylosis that had turnover as well. And so there are a number of hot spots in this dog's skeleton, but what was really rewarding is that very little of this activity localized to organs in the body besides those main organs of excretion of the kidneys. A little bit of activity in the liver, but by and large, it was mostly distributed to the skeleton. And so this was the very first case of a near human-sized 
animal that was injected with this pre-target concept that we showed that the chemistry worked inside a body, which was really exciting to see this. So this is the actual lesion in that dog. You can see there is an osteodestructive lesion uh, that ultimately was bi biopsied as osteosarcoma in this dog in the distal humerus, uh, which is unusual. We usually see osteosarcoma in the proximal humerus, and you can see it on this view as well. And you can see this orange overlay is the pet activity in this case, showing localization of our radiopharmaceutical to the bone. Uh, this is that same bone, just the radiology. This is the CT scan. You can see the destruction of this distal humerus in this dog's case. And this just shows that, again, you have orange overlaying the bone. Uh, you have some orange overlaying the kidneys and liver, but very little in the rest of the uh, internal organs and very little in the bloodstream. So this localized extremely nicely to the skeleton at the lower dose of this phosphonate, which we found very exciting. This is the second dog, and after the first one, we decided to increase the dose of the bisphosphonate to 10 milligrams per kilogram. So we gave more of the click targets localized to the skeleton to be able to get more radioactivity to stick in the skeleton of the dog. And immediately you see this is much more of a reasonable image of a skeleton of a dog when you look at it immediately. It's easy to recognize what we're seeing, that these are the bones of this dog, showing that the radioactivity really localized to the bones. There is activity in the kidneys and the bladder from this dog's excretion, um, a little less in the liver. So that suggests that the increased number of targets within the skeleton probably improve that delivery to the skeleton, which is useful. Uh, this is a, the lesion this dog had. It was a mid-ulnar osteosarcoma. Uh, the, unfortunately, the catheter was placed in this leg. And so we have some catheter hub activity too that's not actually in the dog. It's just sitting next to the dog. Um, but one other interesting finding in this dog, you will note that there is this bright spot in the region of the lungs. And that was immediately concerning to me because we had not recognized any evidence of metastatic disease in this dog from this osteosarcoma. And to this day, I have absolutely no idea why that activity is localized to the lung there. There was no lesion on CT scan. Uh, so this is just a, a focus of activity that sits in the lung tissue that has no associated anatomic structure. Uh, it does overlay to the lungs on the fused scans. And we never identified what why this accumulated there, nor did we ever identify a metastatic lesion developing in that area. So not really sure if this is just a very, very early met and the dog did not live long enough and we didn't follow it long enough to be able to identify the, the full clinical manifestation of that lesion, uh, but it was surprisingly intense and we could not explain why that happened. Uh, again, this is that humeral lesion. You can see it is very intense on this PET scan uh, at the very highest of the intensity scale and it involved a great deal of that, of that mid ulna. This is the, the image you can see, much of the ulna was destroyed. We should have a nice cortex of an ulna sitting right here in this dog's anabrachium, this dog's forearm, and it was just destroyed by this osteosarcoma lesion. And again, almost no other uptake in other soft tissues, some in the liver and, and blood pool, but really minimal. So really beautiful target to background ratio as far as the imaging quality of this uh, and potentially therapeutic utility. We then had a bit of a drought in rolling dogs, and dog three showed up uh, with a dog that had an osteosarcoma of the mandible, who was in the jaw of this dog in this case. And this was kind of a funny-shaped bully that had a whole lot of ossification of the costochondral cartilages. Uh, and so he has kind of a funny-looking scan. Because we had gotten such a better scan in the second scan compared to the first, we chose in this dog to reduce the dosage again of the bisphosphonate back down to five milligrams per kilogram to see if that did indeed degrade the, the skeletal localization again, and it does appear to have. Um, this dog was interesting because not only does it have this aggressive osteosarcoma lesion of the mandible, but the dog also has really severe coxofemoral arthritis, and so there was a lot of uptake in both of this dog's hip joints because of really bad arthritis, and then all of these changes in its uh, its um, uh, the cartilages of its ribs, uh, and you can see some along its spine as well. This dog had a lot of degen degenerative changes in the spine, mostly breed associated. 
So this is that that lesion of the jaw. You can see the mandible is is expanded and has loss of cortical structure, but a lot of uptake of the radiopharmaceutical in that region. A little bit in the dog's shoulder joints. It had some osteoarthritis in both shoulders. This is that CT scan again, more normal um, mandible, very destructive lesion on the contralateral side that's reaching the whole rostral mandible. But again, beautiful uptake. We've got uptake in the bone, we've got uptake in the joints where there is osteoarthritis and ex excretion, but we have no real uptake in the, the soft tissues itself. So very effectively pre-targeted to the bone in this case. Dog four went back up to 10 milligrams per kilogram. And this is actually a better skeletal scan than it appears on immediate exam. And it's because again, it's a maximum intensity projection and the intensity of the lesion in the bladder is extremely high. So the rest of the skeleton is washed out in the scan. Um, also, you see some haziness in the region of this dog's leg. Unfortunately, this dog urinated in the run after it uh, was injected with the radioactivity, before we anesthetized it for the scan, it got it on its fur and then it groomed itself. So you can see there's GI radioactivity from it licking the urine off its fur. So not a real problem in human medicine, fortunately, but it's a challenge in our veterinary patients at times. Uh, but a beautiful uptake in that lesion in the femur. And you can see again, here's that that fur uptake, it looks like the dog's on fire because of the radioactivity in the fur, but that femur is just extremely hot. And it was a really effective delivery of, excuse me, over here, of the radioactivity to that femur. Um, this is normal bone uptake with a little bit of osteoarthritis in the contralateral stifle. This is that bony lesion, a distal femoral lesion, very typical in dogs with osteosarcoma. And again, lots of uptake in the knee, and this is just reversed, uh, and no uptake in those soft tissues uh, with still bladder excretion. So um, really, really good performance of a radiopharmaceutical as we expected. So we had Dr. looked at time Dr. points. Oh, yes, sorry, I had a question. Um, yes. First of all, like that poor dog, like you just can't get away with anything, right? With the scan. <laughs> yeah. But he was sneakily, you know. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, so you noted in some of these examples where uh, there's going to there's a hot area due to something else like arthritis or something like that. So is that an issue then with if the radioisotope is being delivered to those areas as well? That's a great question. Um, I would say the likelihood, given the severity, given the aggressiveness of the cancer, is that the leaves the other distribution to periarticular regions is probably not a clinical concern because it's unlikely to have a huge effect on marrow function in those locations. And the other thing is it actually might have a beneficial effect as far as re reducing pain from osteoarthritis. Uh, there is now a product, it's a radioactive tin product for um, intentional um, uh, um, ablation of the, the synovial lining of very badly arthritic joints to improve comfort and improve function. And it's possible that these dogs would actually get a benefit from that treatment of those radioactive joints uh, that were hot. There is some question about would the distribution to those joints reduce the distribution to the primary tumor itself? And that's something we would just have to evaluate in our Pet, pet guided dosimetry of these to understand the impact on that. So the final dog, we recognized that we had arbitrarily picked a four hour time point because that looked best in mice. So we asked the question, what if, what would happen if we image them at an earlier time point as well as the four hour time point? And would that also give us better distribution data to understand the dosimetry, the dwell time of the radioactivity in the bony lesion and help us to understand what the therapeutic effect might be. And so this is an example of a dog with a distal femoral lesion uh, that you can see that's a really severe lesion here. This is the dog's catheter. It's got a bit of osteoarthritis in that hand and some osteoarthritis in the shoulders and the hips. Um, and then otherwise, it's got really good skeletal distribution. And again, a 10 milligram per kilogram bisphosphonate dose. And we image this dog at one hour after injection and four hours after injection. And 
there are a couple of things that you can see here. One, the, the intensity of the femoral lesion is much less at the one hour compared to the four hour lesion. So there still was additional radioactive accumulation in the tumor over those additional three hours. Also, you can see the spine is more defined, a little bit more intense, more general skeletal distribution. And the brightness of the blood pool as imaged by the heart and great vessels here is less at the four hour mark. So what we're seeing here is just continued excretion, brighter in the kidneys at one hour, cooler in the kidneys at four hours, and continued distribution to the skeleton itself. This is that lesion, a pretty severe osteosarcoma lesion of the distal femur in this dog with really intense radiopharmaceutical uptake. Here is the CT. You can see there's a huge periosteal reaction around the cortex of that bone and, and massive bony destruction. And then again, no real uptake in the other organs, uh, less in the spleen than the liver, interestingly, uh, also true in the other dogs uh, with our regular kidney excretion. Now, one benefit to the PET imaging is it's highly quantitative. And so Dr. Charlie Mites, our radiation oncologist, um, utilized a program to take the PET imaging to create a, an estimation of how, what the dosimetry would be if we were to use the same parameters to deliver a copper 67 dose to these bones. And so this is that bony lesion you can see here. The higher, the more intense, the darker, the color, more red, the more the radioactive dose to that. And in evaluating this, ignore most of the soft tissue because this did sort of a, a forced evaluation, assuming this was a human CT. So I don't know if we can really trust the dose to, to spleen and, and particularly to, to liver in this case. Um, but to the tumor, it estimated about 14 gray of dose to the tumor through physical decay of the copper 67. And so much like we would develop a radiation plan using a linear accelerator for delivering a radiation dose to, the, to a tumor, we can use these PET images or even SPECT images uh, to, uh, to develop a dosimetry plan to understand what the as-delivered dose is to that. And we can also develop a dose wash to the region of the tumor to understand if we have areas that are underdosed. Should this dog, in addition to receiving a therapeutic radiopharmaceutical, potentially receive a, a boost to lower dose areas of the tumor from, say, a linear accelerator to make sure we delivered adequate radiation for control of the tumor in a case like this. Um, the benefit of considering your pharmaceuticals is unlike with the linear accelerator where we have to separately treat each individual lesion if a patient has more than one lesion in the body, the radiopharmaceutical theoretically would treat all of the lesions because it's delivered through the bloodstream, it should reach everywhere in the body and potentially benefit us in terms of, of overall dosimetry and overall patient therapeutics. Now, I made the observation earlier that bisphosphonates are probably not the end game for delivery of this pre-targeting. Uh, bisphosphonates clear from the bloodstream about equally as quickly as this radioactive payload of copper 64 would. And so it doesn't offer us a huge therapeutic advantage to use bisphosphonate targeting and then the radioactive payload, other than the fact that because there is such an excess of bisphosphonate, we could actually fractionate this radiation therapy by delivering sequential radioactive payloads. It's likely that the, the, the click target in this case would persist for maybe even 10 to 20 days in the body for reaccess through further doses of the clicked radioactivity. And so you could give several doses over one to two weeks with the single dose of bisphosphonate potentially. Um, but it is likely that the greater value ultimately will be in using antibody-delivered drugs or portions of antibody-delivered drugs. And this is taken from Nature Reviews Clinical Oncology, um, uh, the, the, a, this review on advancing therapy for osteosarcoma. This is the current understanding of what they refer to, which is a, the first time I've seen this word as the surfaceome of osteosarcoma. So the proteins that decorate the surface of osteosarcoma that could be potentially targeted with antibodies for delivering either immunotherapy or potential radiotherapy or drug delivery. And so in this case, if we imagine that, for example, these are supposed to represent drugs, but if we imagine this to be the click moiety, we could deliver an anti-B7H3 antibody with a click on it 
allow that antibody a week or more to circulate, bind to the tumor, and then be eliminated, probably mostly by the liver, and then we could deliver our clicked radioactive dose afterwards. We could deliver first an imaging payload to understand exactly what the distribution is and calculate the dosimetry. Or if we wanted to use, for example, SPECT imaging, we could actually just deliver a therapeutic dose of lutetium-177 or of copper-67, and then we could visualize that using a SPECT scanner and then calculate the as-delivered dosimetry and decide, do we need a second or a third dose, or do they need external beam to supplement what they've gotten? The other potential here is in the higher LET radiopharmaceuticals or, ra or radionuclides delivering the alpha emitters. Could we deliver an alpha payload through this pre-targeting that would then allow more rapid excretion of the alpha emitter through the kidneys, less long-term circulation of the alpha emitter in the blood so you have fewer alpha decays elsewhere in the body than you do in the tumor, um, and really target the majority of the retained radioactivity to the tumor itself uh, to keep the alphas within the tumor and hopefully reduce some of the off-target radioactive effect. And this is something that obviously bears a lot of future research. It's something we are interested in pursuing. And our goal next is to evaluate candidate antibodies for targeting osteosarcomas in dogs through this pre-targeted approach and potentially identify the ideal antibody radio uh, nuclide pair for potentially treating osteosarcoma in both the primary and the metastatic state so that we can deliver therapeutic payloads to these tumors that don't have the effects on the rest of the body that are negative and potentially improve our outcomes by combining with chemotherapy more effectively as well. So that's what I wanted to share today. I'm happy to answer further questions and clarify anything that I wasn't clear about. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Brian. And um, everyone, please feel free to add any questions to the Q&A, but I'll just start off with a few. Um, just actually from your last slide, which which is a great slide, actually. It was a great graphic. Um, so one of the, I think, I wanted to ask about a radium-223. Are mm -hmm. you familiar? Because that's, that's, you know, has been, I think, sometimes has been considered for use in osteo. And I think that's an alpha. Um, it is an alpha emitter, it, yes. Yeah. And it is naturally bone targeted. Which right, is right. Yeah. yeah. So I just given because there has been some application of that for osteo, just wondering if you can kind of, you know, describe the differences and also perhaps looking at using, I don't know if radium 223 has been used in, has that been tested in canines? Um, I have not seen work in radium-223 in dogs with osteosarcoma that I can recall, certainly not recently. Very possible there's older literature because it was certainly one of the earliest bone-targeted pharmaceuticals. Um, the downside to radium-223 for osteosarcoma is that it is going to target the entire skeleton. It'll preferentially accumulate more where the bone is turning over, much like the bisphosphonate did, but it's difficult to avoid uh, further skeletal dose because it's going to have an affinity for the, the skeletal matrix. And so you're going to see that in the hydroxyapatite matrix. The benefit of the pre-target in this case is that you could use an antibody that's not going to bind to the, the normal bone, but will preferentially bind to the tumor itself. And then your alpha effects are going to be very localized to the tumor and you will not have that whole skeleton alpha effect. And it could be that we see a benefit from that. Um, in my mind, that's something that probably ultimately needs to be tested head to head because the, the radium approach will likely be less expensive than the targeted alpha approach because it doesn't need additional targeting. Nature built that targeting into the skeletal matrix all by itself. And so that's something that I think is a question for the future, but I'm going to, if I had to bet, I'm going to guess that, that targeting with tumor cell specific targeting will probably be superior both in terms of anti-tumor effect as well as in avoiding normal bone, normal skeletal effects and bone marrow effects um, compared to the radium by itself. Uh, and so one of the difference though, I think in this case, because you're using the biphosphonate, which is is 
more look at delivering to the bone structure, but yeah. um, could you use something? I guess one question I wasn't clear on if is this is just going to bone or like, could it target other, could it take a uh, target lung or micromets? Yeah, that the question with the bisphosphonate specifically is if, if there is bone matrix present, it will likely target that lesion. So even small metastases in the lung could theoretically accumulate enough of the pre-targeted bisphosphonate to, to have some effect on them. However, uh, real micromets that have no hydroxyapatite matrix whatsoever likely would not get a useful dose. And that's why our goal ultimately is to target something that is truly tumor cell intrinsic, not peritumoral cell intrinsic. Whereas, you know, the, the matrix is around the tumor cells, it's in the area, but it is not specific to the tumor cell. And that's what these targets on this particular slide might offer benefit over that. Right, but it's it's kind of nice because the click chemistry kind of sets up basically just like that platform and then you yeah. can move, plug and play exactly. with the print. And um, we needed to know, would this work in, you know, in a, in a human sized body? And we now know that from this study, I think that's a very useful advance. Now the question is how do we optimally apply this technology and will it work at an antibody scale very well? Gotcha, okay, got a question um, in about path to clinical trial in humans, um, evaluate in canine first or possible to start phase one trials in humans sooner? I think that I think that it's important that we go back to dogs to ask some more questions because I think that the the surface molecule target is in question. Should we pick GD2? Should we pick EGFR? Should we pick something else that would make a difference? I know that even the insulin-like growth factors are now on the list for potential targeting for these therapies. Um, and then the question also is, what is going to be the optimal radionuclide. Should we be only looking to alphas? Are alphas the answer? Or with the increase in the efficacy of the, or the, I would say the, the, the establishment of efficacy of lutetium-177 now in both neuroendocrine pancreatic cancer as well as in uh, metastatic prostate cancer, perhaps lutetium-177 might be the better way to go for some of these. And I, I think that it's an open question. Uh, I think that we need to do studies in dog tumors that have the same heterogeneity that human tumors do and look for signal of efficacy to decide what is going to be our winner for advancing the human trials first. Yeah, and I was just going to note, um, and we were talking about this earlier, that back in May, we actually had uh, Dr. Janet Yoon from City of Hope on talking about um, a similar type of um, pre-targeting uh, with a uh, from a pharmaceutical company, YMABS. And so if you're interested in this episode, definitely uh, go look back in our library. I think it was in May and it's um, it's the, um, the lutetium DOTA um, radioisotope and uh, kind of an interesting application there, but that's a phase one um, human trial. Uh, another question coming in. Um, so antibody targeting with click chemistry as a potential future direction. If a tumor bound antibody was endocytosed into the tumor cell, it would not be available for the radioligand payload, correct? How do you yeah. evaluate whether a potential antibody binds and remains at the surface or is bound and taken up by the target cell? And that's a big question in target identification. You know, what we, I think it is very important uh, that the target be available on the surface of the cell for enough time to then be able to target with the click chemistry. Uh, so yes, I think in a, 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 high, a rapidly or completely endocytose target is going to be problematic for this. And so that is something that would, will have to be evaluated. And we've discussed that as we discussed some of the targets that we're thinking about pursuing, because that could definitely be a challenge uh, for these and, and would, would abrogate the benefit of the click. Great. Um, so a couple questions about um, combination therapy and uh, and kind of if you've looked into that or have, have kind of looked uh, tested that in the past or plans for testing that in the future. Um, so possibilities of combining this with um, DNA damage repair um, inhibitors or uh, immunotherapy 
Is that something? Yeah, I, all of those have to be considered. So even as simple as radio sensitization with chemotherapy in combination, and if you could deliver the radio pharmaceutical in a way that had minimal impact on bone marrow, combining it with chemotherapy in close proximation might be really, really beneficial. Um, certainly considering DNA damage in, uh, inhibitors to optimize the effect on of damage of the DNA from the radiopharmaceutical. Um, but the other thing to consider too is especially with alphas uh, and trying to induce immunogenic cell death, the combination with checkpoint inhibition could be extremely beneficial so that you could get more of an immunologic response following the immunogenic cell death from the high LET application of the alphas. And so those are all things that we're discussing and are on the table. Obviously, you know, it's hard to do that one trial that answers all the questions. And so I think that the first question has to be targetry. Are we going to optimally be able to get our radioactive payload there by the pre-target approach? understanding that we will lose some to endocytosis, that we will lose, we will have heterogeneity of target expression. And so we could have regions of the tumor, you know, micro regions of the tumor that are not even targeted by our antibody. Uh, all of those things will be challenges that need to be evaluated and overcome moving forward. Are those surface zones we're targeting uh, that you mentioned, which that is a cool word, um, <laughs> are those uh, pretty similar in uh, canines versus humans? Some of them are, yes. Um, and, and we have looked at HER2. Uh, the, it did not appear to us in the work we did that HER2 was of dogs was bound well by trastuzumab, but we've also done some further work in HER2 and osteosarcoma in dogs that suggests to us that it is not it is not expressed in a targetable way on the surface of most canine osteosarcoma. That if it's present, it's probably in an ab, you know it's probably in an aberrant location, either in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm, and much harder to target uh, with an antibody in dogs. Um, but GD2 does appear to be a reasonable target in dogs, and some of the EGFRs seem to cross react as well. So that that is something that. Um, we have to choose our epitope carefully uh, to hopefully find one that we don't have to change our antibody as we translate to humans, because that can change a lot of things. Uh, but the, the that remains a challenge, but GD2 looks promising. And um, so I know, I think you had mentioned somewhere that, you know, kind of using this for unresectable tumors in canines. Um, and so, and I know you've already talked about Kind of all these different ways that we can kind of uh, move on from here to for clinical translation in humans, but um, with the bone targeting piece of it, that seems like the clinical application is more just for bone meds. So thus, like being able to target an antibody, which would, would be able to to target the micromets or yeah. lung metastasis, for example. Um, so is that? Um, something that's for clinical application, I guess, kind of moving towards for, for humans, that it would have to be kind of that antibody target. Cause well, yeah. 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 I mean, I think it's, I, I, I would, I would guess that antibody targeting is going to be optimal. So we have a couple of products on the market and more products being evaluated that are skeletally targeted, either through the bisphosphonate effect or a bisphosphonate delivery, specifically like Quadramet or Samarium EDTMP, um, or through um, Zofigo, the, the radium. Uh, and those have been effective. They have shown you know, improvement in quality of life, and in the case of Zofigo, extension of life. And so it may be that it turns out that there is a role for uh, pre-targeted, fractionated dosing of radioactivity with this. We also don't know that copper might not be a better radionuclide. Uh, and so that's something that's probably worth looking at is other radionuclides for the skeleton. So far, it's been radiometals primarily uh, of, of samarium and and, and, um, and then of course with the, the radium, but the, uh, but the copper is an interesting one because copper participates in so many cellular processes that if it was taken into the cancer cells and then it it transitions to zinc in the uh, and nickel in the process of am I right about that? Sorry, I'm forgetting my copper decay, but it transitions to a different metal in the process of decay. And so that may have toxicity to the tumor cells in ways that we don't 
yet understand. And so there could be benefit to introducing other potential radionuclides through this kind of process. And so I, I, I will say that antibody is probably, I think, the best bet, but there could still be an application to this bisphosphonate targeted approach. And then just some um, other questions about this current study that you did. And um, uh, did you discover an optimal time between the targeting compound and the radioactive compound? We didn't. Uh, in these dogs, we injected them all one hour after the initial bisphosphonate infusion was completed. And so um, we didn't evaluate differences in that. We just had that one dog where we evaluated distribution time and it was about what we expected. But that at least helped us to start to understand the residence curve in order to begin to do some dosimetry calculations. And those are the models that need to be built further as well, or the dosimetry models for this, uh, so that we can start to be predictive of better outcome for patients. And does the um, does the copper actually penetrate the cell? Uh, you know, that's a good question. It's in the area, it's stuck to the hydroxyapatite. Uh, it would certainly likely be taken up by um, osteoclasts in the region, and that could liberate it to be taken up by osteoblasts or cancer cells in the region. And so I would imagine that some of the copper does indeed end up inside the cells, but we haven't begun to quantitate that. And how long does it um, kind of hang out? I guess, like, what's the the uh, shelf life of? of yeah, that? just depends on the the half life of the of the actual isotope itself. Copper sixty four has an has a half life of um, twelve and a half hours. Um, trying to remember, I'm going to do a quick Google for you here. Um, carbon 67 half-life is 60 hours, 62 hours. So it, it's going to be there a lot longer. And there is that low dose rate effect on tumors that could be beneficial also compared to, you know, we do a lot of work with Linux of really ultra high dose rate, looking at flash and things for treating tumors. Uh, the opposite end of that with the low dose rate may have some benefit as well. And that's something the radiopharmaceuticals offer and could be of therapeutic benefit. Hmm. That's and is that what you were talking about? Where you could um, continue to, to like defractionate it and kind of delivering lower doses. Yeah, and that would even be a fractionated version of that low dose rate. So that would even further extend out the the time over which the radioactive the, the radiant therapy was delivered. Got it. And what about um? So in the dogs that you treated, how quickly would you notice a clinical benefit? So these dogs and... were only imaged. So oh, none okay. of these dogs were, this ah, was not okay. a therapeutic radioactive okay. payload. This was simply an imaging pair, uh, the payload. So we don't really have any readout at all on that. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, any other questions for Dr. Brian? And I don't know, maybe, and you can probably just speak to this though. I was just curious about um, side effects, um, again, from a clinical standpoint. Yeah, we saw nothing on injection of either of these compounds. There was no reaction to the injection. The dogs didn't seem to feel it or notice it at all. Uh, and the side effects from the radioactivity, if we were delivering a therapeutic dose, I would expect would really be the organs of excretion potentially, although probably it leaves fast enough that the kidneys and bladder would not be substantially affected um, unless there was some reason that, for example, an alpha was hung up in the kidneys longer than anticipated, and that would have to be studied in the clinical trials. Um, and then the potential effect on bone marrow, that would be the other thing I would expect from this particular bisphosphonate delivered area. Uh, you could have enough antibody accumulation in the liver that, that enough radioactivity could be accumulated in the liver. You could have a patotoxic effect, um, but we would certainly screen for that in the imaging studies initially and make sure we stayed below doses that would be of concern there. Um, you talked about this a little bit, but from here, what is the next thing that you are focused on? Because there are so many different kind of uh, avenues to explore. We're really interested in, in, I think, at least starting with another imaging project using an antibody as our target for the click to show that we can indeed get the radioactivity there. We can see it and we see how much of it accumulates in the tumor. And if we can show that we can get a promising level of dose delivered to the tumor itself, 
then I think the therapeutic study follows that. And we can think about arms in the therapeutic study combining with some of the new immunotherapy molecules available for dogs. Um, but that is a little bit further off yet. Great. Well, we can't wait to hear more about your work in the future and have you back on an Osteobites um, to tell us more. Thank you so much for joining us today and for Thanks making it better for four and two late sarcoma patients. I have to say, even those image, even the images of the dogs are like cuter than like the human imaging. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Yeah, more information on this and all osteobites can be found on the MIB Agents YouTube channel. Um, I also did share a link to that other um, osteobites I was talking about with the also um, pre-targeting um, uh, from uh, YMAPS and um, on our website at mibagents.org and at your favorite podcast place. And next week, we're actually dropping a new episode of our AYA podcast, Osteo, where uh, Osteo Warriors Camila Mia spill a tea on all things osteosarcoma. So look for that next Thursday on the 20th. Um, Osteo Warrior Camille is joined by another Osteo Warrior, Jillian, and our Healing Hearts Grief Coach, Lori Kraus, and they're discussing survivors guilt and grief. Um, and I highly recommend this not only to Osteo Warriors, but clinicians, friends and families. Um, they have a really frank conversation about what survivor guilt and grief looks and feels like and discuss ways to cope and live with and carry those feelings. Um, you can find our Osteobites lineup for the next few months on our website. And if you have any ideas for future topics you'd like to hear about, to share them with us, you can email me at christina at mibagents.org or events at mibagents.org. Um, and thank you again, Dr. Brian, and for spending an hour with us today. And we hope to see you back here on Osteobites on August 3rd when we talk to Dr. Ray. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Brian. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed coming. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Bye.